Hello, everybody. Welcome to Torah Life Ministries. I'm really excited. I interview many people on this program here, and today is one of my favorite guests and somebody I've been uh, following for a very long time, and his book right, is right on my desk, and I, I, I refer to it just about daily. I love it so much. It's called Biblical Foundation of Freedom, and this is our return guest, Art Matthias. Shalom, Art. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good to be here, and shalom to you also. Yes. Well, it's a, such an important topic that you discuss is the spiritual warfare that's happening out there. And everyone loved the connection between the spiritual warfare and our physical health that we did last time. And I'll post a link below to that video, everybody, that we did last time. But I have a lot of questions that people are giving me, and uh, I often address them, but I want you to address them because you talk a lot about spiritual warfare and uh, and, and people having or, or at least dealing with demons and rebuking demons and 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 you you discuss on every level the demons and so on so uh, one of the questions I get often we'll get right into it is is can a believer have uh, demons well that's a common question and it's almost always not uh, not the real question it's the symptom of a bigger question but and a, a comment that goes along with it can good and evil be in the same place at the same time well obviously we're in the world and the world is evil so but the, part of this question is is what does it mean to, what does the word possessed mean and it, it doesn't mean owned it can mean controlled by and we can all be controlled by anger, resentment, or bitterness, and also still have God's spirit with us or in us. Uh, but it doesn't mean that when we're bitter and an evil spirit of bitterness is, is manifesting, that God's spirit isn't there and convicting us and saying, hey, watch out what you're doing. So good and evil is in the same place at the same time, all the time. And it's not a matter of ownership, it's a matter of control. And we can all be controlled by the wrong things at certain times in our life. Like when somebody cuts us off in traffic, or we get somebody does something we don't like and we get angry. Then we start manifesting the Satan spirits instead of God's spirit of love, joy, peace, long suffering. We lose that real quick. Or so you, as you say, and, and I would say is uh, choosing who to serve, right? Yes, we choose moment by moment who we serve, as, as scripture says. So we're constantly faced with these choices. And that's really all it is, is don't make it any more complicated. Satan cannot make me or you or anybody do anything, and neither can God. That's not how this works. God can't make us do anything. The devil can't make us do anything. It's all down to our choices. We have to become responsible for our actions. So in the scriptures, it says, uh, so when Yeshua descended, he, le he leaves us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that those that are righteous will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So if somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit, do they have room for uh, these demons in their life to attack them? Well, if we're, being, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us, I, uh, I think the answer to this is, did Yeshua have the Spirit, Holy Spirit controlling him? And was he tempted? But he made a choice not to yield to that temptation. So we have that same choice that he had. Yeah, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, but if we are making the choice to yield to the temptation, then we're going to go into the bitterness and allow a different spirit to manifest. So are you suggested in your uh, understanding of scripture? Oh, sorry, dear. Okay, so are you suggesting in your understanding uh, of what the scriptures say that uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, once it's with us, uh, we could still make uh, decisions not to listen to it? Absolutely. Okay. I, think, I think that's what we all do all the time. That's the, uh, that's the choose whom you're going to serve moment by moment. We have that choice in our behavior. And um, it's not just thoughts. Everything in the Hebrew world, in the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew language is, is actions. It's a, they're all verbs. And it's not what you say 
that you believe, it's what you actually do. So that temptation always comes back down to our behavior. What are we actually going to do with this temptation? Stop it or yield to it? Now, would somebody who has the Holy Spirit make those poor choices and continuously yeah. choose to, to let these demons or, or listen to these demons? Well, you, you said a, continue, a key word there, and that's the word continuous. We all sin. We all make mistakes. But uh, Hebrews, uh, I believe Hebrews 11, or maybe it's 10, 27, 28, talks about when we continually are involved in a, a behavior, then at some point there is no longer repentance. We have to stop it, in other words. And I think if... We need to go to some of the references to the Holy Spirit that come earlier in Scripture than the New Testament if we want to fully understand it. In Ezekiel 36, it talks about how Jehovah gives us a, a new heart of flesh and how he puts his spirit inside of us and how his spirit then leads us in obedience to his Torah. And if the Holy Spirit, if that, whatever that spirit in us is not leading us in obedience to scripture, it's not his spirit. And I think we can, I have no reason to believe we, we can't have both. So you're, uh, so you're suggesting that a person could have the Holy Spirit and still be, whether you want to use the word, uh, infested with or possessed with. There's room controlled for, by is the word I would use. Controlled by. So there's room for the Holy Spirit uh, to, to be in us and us to still listen and choose to listen to uh, the demons. Yes. Yes. Now, I think Jesus's life on earth, Yeshua's life on earth demonstrated that he was around evil constantly. Now, would making the right choice and uh, 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 the fruit of the spirit be evidence of the Holy Spirit, or not necessarily, because we could still uh, do things even though we have the Holy Spirit. Well, if we walk, if we are obedient to principles in His Word in His Torah, we will be blessed, whether we are a believer or not. His 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 Word will not return void. So, if someone follows His uh, principles in Scripture about uh, money and how you take care of employees then you're going to be blessed and you're going to have good relationships with your employees. Uh, but and they don't have to be a believer for that to happen. That's the power of his word. But for me, the Ezekiel 36 passage is critical. It's critical. If I am, if it's really God's spirit in me, that spirit in me is going to be keep correcting me and leading me to obedience of, to his Torah, to his word. All the word Torah is, is a Hebrew word that means precepts and, and instructions. That's all that word means in English. So if his spirit is within me, I'm going to be convicted of my improper behavior and convicted to be obedient to the Torah, so, his precepts and instructions. So can the Holy Spirit... Uh come in and out of us at different times or is it just a matter of once you have it you have it but you still might make bad choices uh, i think we can tell the holy spirit to leave us and i think that's an active choice as it was a choice to accept it uh, i think salvation is the same way i made it i made a choice in salvation to uh, accept his covenant it's not a few magic words in a sinner's prayer it's i am accepting your covenant i'm I'm going to do what your covenant tells me to do. And then he has obligations. God does. Jehovah does to do his part of the covenant. But it's a covenant relationship. In English and in, in the Western viewpoint, we look at the relationship as a saying a few magic words in a sinner's prayer. I don't believe that's biblical at all. So salvation and having his Holy Spirit in us is walking in obedience. That's the fruit of it. And I know the importance of, of speaking, and you said we could uh, tell the Holy Spirit to leave, but do you think by our actions, uh, which is very uh, communicationable also, that we're telling the Holy Spirit to leave by the choices we continuously make? Yes. And when you look at it from a Hebrew concept, that it's not about words, it's about what you do, then if you really want to know what you believe, you look at what you do. 
This is why, why the Hebrew world emphasizes behaviors, but the Western Christian world emphasizes words. They made a, we've made a big mistake in looking at the scriptures from a Western eyes and not through the Eastern Hebrew culture and the Hebrew language. Then we make these mistakes. It's all about words. And we become afraid of actions because we've been taught, well, if you do something, then you're going to have to um, earn your salvation. You're putting yourself back under the law and you're going to have to earn your salvation, which is total fallacy. Nobody can earn their salvation. Moses, Abraham, Adam, all those people were saved by faith, by obedience, by grace, which is obedience. Um, we've been sold a bill of goods to be afraid of obedience. That's the biggest deceit the devil could ever bring in our lives is to make us be afraid of obeying God's word because it's a light to our path, it's health to our bones, it's the answers to life. Uh, God gave his word, his Torah on Mount Sinai uh, and let us know what he expected. No other God, and there's millions of gods out there has ever done that. They So they end up, looking at their gods as somebody they have to appease all the time. Jehovah God the Father is not someone we have to appease. He's a loving father that tells us what he wants. And if you love me, obey me. It's a, his obedience is his love language. And in obedience, then we find the path to walk on. Life becomes uh, not complicated. When we know his path and know what, what how he blesses, it's, a, it's a, not a complicated life. It's a blessed life. Would you think that people continuously choose to follow the demons and not listen to the Holy Spirit? Would you think or suggest they don't love Yahweh or they're just making bad choices? I think you could be both. The, the, the longer you walk in disobedience, then we're going to have to question. Jesus says, Yeshua says, if you love me, obey me. And if we continually choose to walk in disobedience, at some point we've got to say we don't love him. And he's full of grace and mercy and he gives us time. I think um, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where, where Yeshua was laying out the rules of his kingdom. And he says, you've heard it said, but I say almost always you've heard it said was not a factual thing scripturally. It was somebody that somebody taught. Uh, and then he would give an answer but i say to you which is always out of the torah or the tanakh it was out of the scriptures he directly quoted it and he summarized the rules of his kingdom in matthew 7 21 22 and 23 when he said when a multitude came to him and he says i don't know you depart from me and they complained we've done all these works in your name and he says depart from me and he calls them lawless which means they did not follow his commandments so we need to take that passage to heart and make sure we're following his commandments. And then we can, then his word is a light to our path. It's health to our bones. It's, it's an answer to all of life's challenges. It's a way of life that he prescribes for us. That's the, the rules of his kingdom are his way of life, not what we think it ought to be. So in Ephesians 4, 27, it tells us, as believers, not to give a place to the devil, a room or a right to us. And we do that every time we sin. It doesn't mean we lost our salvation. It doesn't mean that we've lost the Holy Spirit. It means we are need to correct some behavior. But it could mean the Holy Spirit has left us for that time we're that's, sinning. And he can come and go as well. At some point in time, God turns us over to our own devices. So if you go if you go to Exodus and talk about Pharaoh, and where in English it talks about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, there's four different Hebrew words used there. And both, it starts out with God strengthening Pharaoh's heart. And then as Pharaoh continues to disobey, the last time the English says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart is after Pharaoh agreed to let the Israelites go, but then backed out on the deal, and God turned him over to his own devices, as Proverbs 1, what 26, 27, and 28 says. And at that point in time, uh, 
there, there is the grace is not intervening in your life anymore. And there, there's the, the full consequences of your actions are going to come forward. What about people that suffer from uh, physical addictions? Uh, so do you think this is a, a, a spiritual warfare and just uh, making the wrong choices? Or do you think that they they just really are physically, there's no other answer. This is what the situation they're in. Well, I think it eventually goes to that. There's that, that, that becomes a physical, very much a physical, even a DNA situation, but it starts out in pain. Everybody that goes into an addiction, whatever it is, in some way is self-medicating, using the TV set or food or a drug, prescription or non-prescription, to cover up the pain that started out with an anger, resentment, a bitterness, or a bitterness at being abused, or, you know, there's a lot of nasty things to happen to people. And when we don't forgive, and when we live in that bitterness, we start self-medicating. In many ways, we call them addictions, but they all start out in, a, in abuse that we do not know how to forgive or don't forgive that results in our, our man-made way of dealing with the pain from that abuse, which then becomes uh, too many trips to the refrigerator, alcohol, drugs. That becomes our way of covering up the pain, self-medicating. We call it an addiction, but we have total control over it. And you take the most severe cocaine or whatever addiction you want, and all that's doing is covering up their pain and their shame. And as they repent and forgive, then they find God's real answer. Some people will go into an addiction of multiple personalities. And so that they say, it didn't happen to me. It happened to Joe or Sally or Sam. And that's a way of self-medicating also. Um, we're turned to a, a man's way, a human way, or even a demonic way of dealing with pain versus God's way when he heals our broken heart. Is any decision that leads to an addiction, spiritual warfare, and making the wrong choices, or is it sometimes just a bad choice? Well, it's all of the above, because a bad choice is that we're being tempted to make a bad choice. So there's spiritual warfare. Am I going to listen to the devil tempting me to make this bad choice? Or am I going to listen to the Holy Spirit, which is saying, no, don't do that. So I think all three of your categories are, are there. Anything that but, leads to, to, the, to the negative uh, or something negative in a life ultimately is listening to uh, the demons. Yeah. This is listening to that, what we call in biblical foundations, the accusing spirit. That voice that comes and says, oh, no, you don't really need to obey. Or, hey, you, you don't have to forgive that person. You know, we, you, you, they're, they're nasty. You don't need to forgive them. But forgiveness sets me free. It doesn't set the perpetrator of this free. So somebody that's been abused, if they want free of the bitterness and the anger and the shame that's, in, that's came to them in that abuse, they have to forgive. The forgiveness does not justify what the perpetrator did, but it sets the victim free. So if I want to be a victim the rest of my life, I'll stay in the bitterness. If I want to have control of my life and charge of my life and walk in God's precepts, I have to do what he says. And he tells me I need to forgive them. And when I forgive, the evidence of forgiveness is, is the pain goes away. I can go back and look at that, that memory of that abuse, and there's no longer shame, and there's no longer guilt in it. There's no longer pain in it of any kind. That's, and then when the pain goes away, the physical body settles down. As we live in that pain, that pain creates uh, what medicine calls a fight flight response. And so all the extra adrenaline, all the extra cortisol just flows through your bloodstream that those, those hormones destroy your T cells, B cells, macrophage cells of your immune system, opening you to any kind of a disease. So do you wanna live in diseases or do you wanna live in health? Well, if you want to live in health, you got to do what God says. You have to forgive. Or the natural feedback loops that are built in your body are going to happen. And you're going to get diabetes when you live in constant fight flight. Uh, you're going to get a suppressed immune system, which leads to any kind of a disease. Uh, so we have, these are choices. So, and we're being tempted by the devil to make the bad choice and being convicted by the Holy Spirit. 
So that's the spiritual war right there. Yes. Do you think mental illness is a, a, is a spiritual warfare 100% of the times? Um, mental disorders when people have like bipolarness, is it, can it be just a chemical a mess up or is it 100% spiritual warfare? Well, some of this is chicken and egg type of a question. Sure. Because it, like, let's take depression. America defines depression as a shortage of serotonin. Well, France decides it, defines it entirely differently, and they will limit serotonin to conquer depression. Well, I think we can all give a look at ourselves and find the real answer. The last time you were depressed, what were you thinking about? And your thoughts are going to be a lot of self-pity, a lot of woe is me. And as we dwell in those negative thoughts, those negative thoughts suppress serotonin levels, increase histamine levels. And we have a choice to live in the negative, or we have a choice to do Philippians 4, 7, and 8, as scripture tells us, to live in the things of good report. So bipolar, you know, we're, we're high and flying, and then we're down and depressed. Uh, what thoughts are going on in that process? So almost every mental illness that I can go through and think about comes down to our thought processes. We are, if we're, if we're living in a fantasy world, that's an escape. We're escaping the pain instead of dealing with the pain. Schizophrenia, or they're living in a fantasy world instead of dealing with the pain that's happened in their lives, as scripture says. So uh, I don't believe any of the psychiatry, uh, their diagnoses, especially when you look at the founding roots of psychology, it's rooted in eugenics. They had to find a, a, a way to define the undesirables in the eugenics world when they wanted to get, when to kill off the, the undesirable people. So that's why psychology was invented. I got a PhD in it, so, you know, it's mostly worthless. Now, what about the physical disease? Because that's a big part of your ministry is helping people overcome physical ailments through spiritual yes. warfare. So is it 100% like if somebody's suffering from an ailment, is it always connected to a, a spiritual entity to one level or another? Or can it be sometimes like the blind man in scripture that is for other reasons? Well, I would say at least 90% of the time uh, the, that is tied to a thought process, which is a spiritual war process. So uh, for an example, autoimmune diseases, um, lupus, MS, Crohn's, that type of disease, a lot of eczemas uh, are autoimmune. And as you, as you, in an autoimmune disease, your, nerve, your, your immune system is attacking your own body. Well, as you attack yourself, as you call yourself dumb, stupid, uh, ignorant, uh, call you, curse yourself, then you're, you're commanding your immune system to attack your own body physically. So when we, we repent for our self-hatred, we learn to repent, get rid of our shame and our guilt. Then the autoimmune diseases heal. The rheumatoid arthritis heals. Um, if we if we take it, uh, we'll find a similar thing in almost every disease. I had over 100 allergies. And in an allergy uh, is nothing more than an overactive immune system attacking pollens or things I eat. And it's a misguided immune system that's attacking milk or food or uh, something I breathe. And that starts out with me in my pain, my anger, my bitternesses that has suppressed my immune system and trained it to act abnormally. As I deal with my bitternesses and my fears and my anxieties, then my immune system starts to act normally and the allergies go away. I got rid of over 100 of them. And I've had literally thousands of people that were basically total universal reactors have no more allergies as they go through this process of walking in God's path, walking in obedience by forgiving, repenting, and uh, getting rid of the angers, the shames, the guilts, all the things that key your immune system go crazy. Is it your understanding from scripture that Everyone, whether they uh, proclaimed Yeshua as Messiah or not, has the ability to experiencing the blessings that come along with obedience to Torah, uh, regardless if they uh, accepted Yeshua. So everyone from every religion all over the world, if they're obedient to Torah, 
will experience those blessings. Blessings. Uh, yes. And, yes. And the other side of that is, you know, the salvation issue. That's what Yeshua is about. He's not about uh, the the blessings and the cursings. He's about the the salvation. But the blessings come along with the obedience. Would, would that, that be your viewpoint? Uh, yes. Uh, there's a rap, famous rabbi that's uh, written a book called Thou Shalt Prosper. Now, he's not a follower of Messiah, but he's taught people how to prosper by using Torah principles. Things out of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus, things out of, out of the, the Old Testament, which in Hebrew is called the Tanakh. And when he teaches those principles, his people, his readers prosper because they're following God's ways. Even if they don't believe in God, God says, my word will not return void. And this is proof of that. Anybody that does it. Now, that's also an evangelistic tool he uses. When we do his word, I work routinely with non-believers, teaching them to forgive. As they forgive their diseases, their shame, their guilt, their anger goes away, as God's word says it will. Then they say, oh, I want more about, I want to know this Jehovah. I want to know this Yeshua more. This is all evangelism. If we would prove that his word works, people want more of it and more of it and more of it. Now, those people in the church today that are just uh, tremendously suffering because of their disobedience, but have accepted Yeshua to supposedly secure their salvation, uh, do you believe that uh, a person could accept Yeshua and choose to continuously live, whether it's deception or anywhere, continuously live against Torah or against the instructions? Well, that, you're asking some really hard questions. And the answer is, I'm going to give you a straightforward, simple answer. Right back to Matthew 7, 4, 21 and 22 and 23. If you walk dis in disobedience to the Torah, if your Torahlessness, or better said in the translation, uh, lawlessness is how the English does it. Torahlessness is the, the Hebrew way of saying that. And if that's where you're walking, and he says, I don't know you. Depart from me. And then you go to 1 John 3, and it defines sin as torlessness or lawlessness. So if, if, if anybody, all of us need to take those verses and really, really pray through them, contemplate them. What is Yeshua really teaching here? And when you look at what Yeshua did when he was on the earth, he did not start a brand new religion. All he did was correct the falsehoods from the Pharisees and the what, what Matthew says, the traditions of men, and corrected their mistakes, how they improperly interpreted the Torah, and he taught them the proper interpretation of Torah, and says that the Torah will never pass away. He did not start a brand new religion or brand new covenant, as the church claims. He renewed the covenant that he set up at Mount Sinai. He didn't make any mistakes at Mount Sinai. He's not a God that makes mistakes, but the church says he is. And so in, in the church's arrogance, they've thrown out his instructions for uh, wellness and happiness and a path, to, God's path to walk on. They've thrown it out. So I think we need to take Yeshua's words in Matthew 7 very, very seriously. Yes. Well, uh, as you can tell, I'm being very careful not to ask you what you believe and asking you what you see in scripture, because I believe your teachings are wonderful and you give so much scripture to back up your, your understandings. And I appreciate that so much. But my understanding of scripture, uh, the Holy Spirit would never make a person feel good about living in sin. And if a person is being disobedient to Torah uh, and, and feels good about it, uh, they're not being led by the right spirit. Would you agree? I agree 100 percent. See, that's why I go back to uh, the passages in Ezekiel 36. When when we, when his spirit, when he puts his spirit within us, and that's the word that's used there, because often people say, "Is his spirit on us or within us?" He was only on people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's in them. Well, baloney. The Ezekiel 36 and many other passages talk about how the spirit was in them. And then that his spirit led us in obedience. And we see that in our lives if we're being convicted of sin. If we're not being convicted and we think that it's proper just to throw out Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, 
then we got the wrong spirit in us. I agree with you. And then and um, spirit, on a spiritual level, spirits move in and out. They're not just, oh, you got it and you have it or you don't. I mean, can they move out on a daily basis, on a minute basis, or is it something that's like months in the process? Well, when somebody cuts you off in traffic and you get angry, how quickly did that happen? <laughs> I right. think we need to look back at the simple things we live in every day. When some jerk cuts us off in ta traffic and we, we call him the jerk and flip him off or whatever we get angry, whatever we do, uh, how quickly does that happen? Or when somebody does something that, that makes us angry, why didn't we forgive before we got angry? They didn't make us angry. It was our choice to let it become angry. In, in, in Ephesians, that makes sense? It, it makes perfect we're, sense. In Ephesians, we're full of choices constantly, minute by minute, second by second. Well, you talk so we can about, flip back and forth. Exactly. In the book, it says in Ephesians 6, it's a battle that's continuously going on, a spiritual warfare battle continuously going on. And Every minute. We can never let our guard down. Absolutely. Agree 100%. Yes. What's also really an interesting study, Paul, is just to go into a word search, type in the word spirit, start in Genesis, and throw out the verses that talk about some other spirit. Study the verses that talks about God's spirit and see what that spirit does in people's life. And one of the first examples is, is Genesis 41, where, where Pharaoh, who is Amenhot the third, that's the exact Pharaoh, was talking to Joseph, and, and Pharaoh Amonat III says to Joseph, truly the spirit of God is in you because of your wisdom and your knowledge and all these things, talking about all the ways that Joseph ran Egypt to, to, in the seven good years and the seven bad years, how he set laid aside grain, how he learned to control the Nile in the second and the seven bad years, creating a canal system that still exists in Egypt, and, uh, and the, the marvelous things that God, Jehovah, gave to Joseph to solve all those problems. And you can take another look at that in, in Exodus uh, 34, 35, when the gentleman there that God put his spirit on and gave him wisdom and knowledge in all things, and he was able to recreate all of the temple articles here on earth, the heavenly temple articles. You look at Ezekiel, Daniel. Uh, Daniel was given great authority, knowledge, and understanding to talk about the, the 70 weeks and explain that. Um, that's the evidence that I see, the, the real evidence of the Holy Spirit is, is God's wisdom and knowledge and understanding of all things. That's what I ask him for all the time. And the outcome of that is love, choice, peace, and long suffering. The outcome of that is, is healings and miracles and deliverances. Those are the natural outcome of walking in obedience. His wisdom and understanding in all things comes from us walking in obedience. No other way. Some people will try to say the Holy Spirit was different in the original covenant from the renewed covenant. What do you say to something like that? Well, I hear that all the time. He did, he was on them then and in them now. Uh, that's just a human doctrine that's not scriptural. Does God change? He says, God says over and over again, Jehovah says, I do not change. So you can take all the dispensational doctrines that say at this time frame, God dealt with people this way and that time he did it a, di a different way. That's, those are all man-made doctrines, every one of them. Jehovah says, I do not change, period. So now it says in scripture, the only unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Would you say continuously not obeying the words of our creator? Uh, and if we have the Holy Spirit leading us, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be just that disobeying yes. and not walking in continued disobedience and, and then saying that God gave me this cancer. You know, blaming God for what the devil does. That's what we do when we walk in disobedience. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And if we continue to live in that, then we're done. There's no salvation. I think it's a continually living in blaming God for what the devil does. And every time we teach a man-made doctrine, that's what we're doing. 
Now, when you say what the devil does, do you mean by our choices, by following uh, the path yes. that leads us? Because he doesn't, like you said, he's not doing it. He's just uh, convincing us to make the wrong choices that lead to that. I agree. Yes. So the, the devil has his way, God has his way, and we got a choice. And every individual decision, which way we're going to go. Whom we're, choose this day, this minute, this second, whom you're going to serve. I heard something a long time ago that uh, the, the, the devil can't make us do anything physically, but he could destroy us mentally to make us make those choices that will destroy ourselves physically. And how do you feel about that? Well, I, I believe it all starts through that mental process. When we, when I, when I, somebody's coming to me with specific diseases that I, that I talk about a lot in my book, uh, His Own Image, those diseases are a clue to me about their thought process. A little bit ago, I talked about the, the autoimmune diseases and how the, the, those diseases are tied to beating ourselves up and condemning ourselves. So if, if somebody has Crohn's or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I know that they're very hard on themselves, which is a sin. So when we learn to repent for that sin, see, when we, when we can identify a sin in our lives, that's finding an answer. That's never a condemnation. But when I learn that, that I'm condemning myself, then I shout hallelujah, and I, then I repent. I've applied God's answer to it. I stop condemning myself. The autoimmune disease or the allergies the, uh, uh, are going to go away. We see that happen continually in thousands and thousands of people. So, What do you think the scriptures mean by righteousness of the Pharisees? The righteousness of the Pharisees was of the Pharisees and not of God. It wasn't God's righteousness. It was all about their way, their rules. And because he says, uh, he, he condemned that. He condemned the righteousness of the Pharisees, called them the traditions of the elders. Uh, we could also call it the oral traditions, the oral Torah, the oral rules of the Pharisees, because they believed that Moses did not write down all of God's Torah in Exodus 24. They teach he only wrote down part of it. And so they are adding to the scriptures. So the righteousness of the Pharisees is adding to and taking away from God's word. And the church has done exactly the same thing. All these law versus grace doctrines, dispensational doctrines are all adding to and taking away from, from God's word. They're the righteousness of the Pharisees in today's version. Okay, switching topics here. A big part about pro-life ministries is just making the right choices and so on. When it comes to this topic, I see uh, King David uh, making a very bad choice uh, in the sin he committed with Bathsheba. I see uh, Judah in scripture walking along the road and seeing a prostitute and being led to make uh, a really bad choice. Uh, and, and, and you see this uh, concept out throughout the scripture, but then you brought up Joseph, who was being physically seduced by uh, Potiphar's wife and made the, ch the decision to run away from that temptation. Mm -hmm. So from a man's, from a man's viewpoint, uh, we have this so-called weakness, so-called of the physical attraction through visual things, which uh, brings many men to create adultery and many other issues. Uh, so what do you think about this? Is a man just have, is a man having a weak moment? Are we living against our natural desires? Because, you know, men in society today are being tempted on a daily basis by, uh, by women immorally dressed and so on. Is it just that we're living so far out of our, 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 our natural environment, the way we were born, that it's creating this issue? Or is it just men having a weak moment and being led by the, by Satan? Well, I think we need to look at what our human natural environment is versus God's way. And God's way is you never yield to that, as David yielded to it. And there was great consequences in David's life, but also he experienced forgiveness. Uh, if he would have repented sooner, I don't believe that boy that was born, that first son, would have died. Um, we have to be responsible for our choices and our actions. We can't blame it on that woman that's dressed seductively. That's We make a choice to yield or not. We can't ever set aside our personal responsibility to walk in obedience. But when we, 
Adam walked in disobedience. God created a way for him to return with an animal sacrifice. But when we look at those animal sacrifices in, in, the, in Leviticus, we find that there's never an animal sacrifice for the intentional sin, only for the unintentional sin. So how did David get forgiveness? How did uh, uh, for Bathsheba versus when he numbered the people? I mean, God is still remembering that in 2 Kings 15, 5. How did that happen? Well, and then we look at other, many other scriptures where repentance is available in the Tanakh, in various passages where people repented. So how can they repent for a sin when if the atonement has not yet happened? How could Abraham be saved by faith in, according to Hebrews 4, uh, if, if, the, if the cross, the atonement event, if lack of a better word, had not yet happened? So we, we tend to think that Old Testament people were saved by looking forward to the cross, and we were saved by looking back to it. Uh, I, I've taught it that way, but I'm thinking that maybe there's a different answer that makes more sense, because uh, Revelation 13, 8 says that the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. So if that is true, the Lamb was actually slain in the heavenly temple in the order of Melchizedek. Yeshua couldn't have been slain in the order of the Levites because he was not a Levite. So, do you so believe- if that was, if the atonement happened in the heavenly temple before men were recreated, that would explain how Adam could have repentance and how for, for, the, uh, for the intentional sin. God offered that to Cain and Cain said no. Uh, Abraham uh, repented twice when he, when he with with what he did with Hagar and uh, his uh, male assistant. I forget the name right now. Um, And God renewed the covenant both those times, established it the third time with the sign of circumcision. Then uh, Sari became Sarah and was able to conceive. Abram became Abraham when he had finally learned to walk in obedience. But he was forgiven because Yeshua's blood had already been shed. The lamb had already been shed. I know that's a wild, crazy thing to think about, but it helps explain why temple sacrifices did not cover the intentional sin and why repentance was done many times to the Torah, to Nakh. So if the Holy Spirit is available to all those that proclaim Yeshua, all believers, the Holy Spirit's available, do you think that every person uh, that uh, do you do you think that every person that's a believer that's sinning is committing intentional sin because now that's their choice even though they have the, you know a non-believer could say well I didn't know or I didn't have the Holy Spirit leading me so it's an unintentional sin but every believer has that choice so would you say every sin a believer makes is now intentional sin? I would think pretty close to that today, but there is something in scripture about those that did not have his word, did not have the Torah, did not know. And there is a special dispensation, if you want to use that word. Uh, uh, Hebrews got four different levels of sin, four different words that are used for sin. And only one of them is intentional. So uh, I, I want to know. I want to learn. I want to know because even if I'm walking in a sin that I don't know about and there's a lesser penalty for it, I still am walking in sin and I'm not walking in his full blessing. I want to walk in his full blessing. So I want to be a mature believer that thoroughly distinguishes good and evil, as Hebrews 5.14 says. I want to be a vessel of honor, as 2 Timothy talks about, where he can trust me with anything. I want to be his bride. Revelation 19 says that his bride are those who have purified themselves. To purify myself, I have to know discernment. I have to know difference between good and evil. I have to get the evil, the disobedience out of my life. Then he can trust me with any assignment. Then he can impart to me all that wisdom and knowledge and understanding in all things. That's what I want. I want to be his bride. I want that special, special relationship as being his bride. 
uh, to be the vessel of honor as uh, Second Timothy talks about, they're the same thing. I want to be spotless without, without spot or blemish. So if we're serious about our walk with God, that's where we're going to go. If you're not serious about it and become lawless, you may miss out. Is it possible for somebody to accept Yeshua and not have access to the Holy Spirit? Uh, probably not immediately, but if they continue to live in disobedience, they continually blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then I think that's a whole different story. I think, I think when, when in, the, in the beginning, all of our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, as, as Revelation talks about. Then we, our behaviors, our actions, we're going to tell whether they stay written in his Lamb Book of Life or not. He starts us all out whole, and it's our actions that are going to keep us there or not. Sure. Well, we spoke about earlier the immoral dressed woman, a moral dressed woman, and uh, it's rampant today all over the churches and everywhere. Yeah. And so, do you think that uh, a woman that's dressed uh, immodestly uh, is definitely being led by the wrong spirit 100% of the time? In, in her choice to dress immorally, in that choice, she's led by the wrong spirit. But we, we can have a mixture of spirits in us. She can, that person, you know, whether it's a male or female, can make bad choices and still make good choices. Uh, we can quench the spirit. We can give places to the devil in different parts of our life. Doesn't mean he owns all of us but it means we got something to fix. So the Holy Spirit, in today's culture, these women are put in a tough spot. That's how they're expected to dress in a lot of places. But a woman of purity is going to learn a different answer and say, oh, I don't have to expose all of my body. I can be modest and be a woman of virtue uh, and still be loved and accepted. It's not about what I look like. It's about who I am inside. And as we become whole, with God, that's where we come to think. Uh, we're created in his image. And that image isn't about looks or appearances. It's about character. We're, we're created in his character. And his character isn't exposing our flesh all over in, in, in nakedness. Nakedness in scripture, it means to be without the Torah. It means to be without God. So there's, it's not a positive word in any sense. So, but we all have things to work with. We all have things to fix. So if our heart is to fix it, he's going to tell us about it. Now, we need to be careful with the, the words and, 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 and the idea of what we're talking <clears throat> and discussing. So I want to be clear because I don't want people to uh, find something wrong with this because I, I'm in agreement and I like what you're saying here. But now, if somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit, filled means filled. There's, there's no room for anything else. We're filled. And you, you said a person can have uh, different spirits dwelling within them. So when we looked at the word possessed and filled versus being led by a different spirit, can you clarify that up a little? Can somebody have uh, the Holy Spirit and a uh, spirit of a demon at the same time in a possessive way? Or is it just, again, them being led? Well, if, you, if defining the word filled the way you defined it, leaving room for nothing else, uh, then it, with that definition, if we're sinning, if we're angry or bitter or, or fearful, then we're not fully filled. We have allowed room in us for the fear. Anxiety and fear is a sin. That means we're not trusting God in that area of our life. We can be trusting in some other areas, but in this area, we're not. So I don't believe, we're, to use your definition, we're not fully filled. We have his spirit, but we have other spirits. Right. So somebody can have a mixture of spirits until they're fully filled. Feel, it's one or the other. They can be both. And I think you could use a different terminology here when you talk about sanctification. It's a process. And so we can be partially, or, and, a, and the goal is to be fully sanctified where there is none of this uh, other garbage in us at all. That's the, that's the bride who has purified herself. And that's the goal in life. And it must be possible or he would not have set that as our goal, to be the bride or be the vessel of honor. Uh, who's, in Timothy, it says a vessel of honor is, as, uh, has purged themselves of all of the iniquities. So it's a process. Yes. But, but it's also a realistic goal. 
And even if somebody is filled by the Holy Spirit, they could still make the wrong choices, uh, be led to make the wrong choices, which even almost Continue. puts them more in a responsible situation because somebody that's, like you said, the non-believer, they kind of have a little leeway. Somebody that says they're filled and then they start making these bad choices. Now you're getting close to like, well, you, ha you, you were led by the right choice, but you decided the wrong one. We all can make mistakes. This is why Jesus was tempted so many times. And he never yielded to it. And in, in Luke 3, it talks about when the Satan tempted him for 40 days. And then it says that the evil spirit, the Satan left him for a time. He came back. Yeshua was always tempted. But being tempted doesn't mean you've sinned. That's part of this life. The, the only time you sin is when you yield to that temptation. And even then, it gives you a great opportunity to repent. It's not the end. Of oh, all. yeah. He's a God of mercy and grace. Uh, I like it. I, I like the application of Revelation 13, 8, that the atonement happened before the foundation. The lamb was slain before the foundation. That to me explains uh, so much in scripture and explains to his grace. He didn't treat the Old Testament people different than the New Testament people, or he would be a sinner. If he had favorites, as James talks, so James 4 talks about then he's a sinner. Yeshua, Yehovah doesn't have favorites. He treats us all exactly the same. Can you tell the audience here the, the, the joy of, of living with the evidence of, the, of following the right spirit that comes along the peace and the joy? Because, I mean, we don't know what we don't know when we're younger. But as we go down our life and we start following these principles and following Torah, there's certain situations maybe 20 years ago we would have been yelling at the guy that cut us off, but now we can just wave and it doesn't even bother us at all. Can you share a little bit with your experience about how great and joyful that is each day? Well, I, first of all, I haven't got it all together. I, I get upset sometimes when I get cut off in traffic. So I, I got to first admit, I got, I still got work to do, but when I have chosen to use his Torah as the path for my life, and just to do the simple things that he asked me to do and to live in his love language of obedience, life has become uh, so much easier, so much simpler. There doesn't mean there isn't challenges, but I know what he expects. I don't have to go out and do all this stuff in, in a penance or appeasement. Uh, I, I see Jehovah, God the Father, as this loving, kind, heavenly Father that's told me how to live life and be abundantly blessed in abundance but when Satan comes to kill and destroy. Uh, I know what he wants. If you don't know what he wants, wh how, what do you do? You're in a quandary all the time. When we throw out his path, his Torah, his, we, we were in a quandary. We don't know what he wants. So we're striving. I don't strive. I'm highly productive. But I don't strive. I just get up in the morning and got a happy smile on my face because I'm going to go live my life his way, do what his Torah says, and it's peace. It's shalom. It's peace. When I mess up, Lord, forgive me. And he puts me back on his path. So that doesn't mean I do it perfectly uh, because I have the blood of Yeshua to, to take the guilt and the penalty of my sin. So <clears throat> I want to talk about your, your current book uh, and your future book or, or your latest book. But before I do that, uh, I want to touch upon this topic one more time. I believe that Yahweh knows our minds and our decisions before we make it. I believe the enemy does not know our minds, but he reacts off the way we act. And he knows our weaknesses because of the way we respond to certain things and our lack of faith. So the enemy can't read our mind, but the enemy knows when we're scared, a lack of faith. And in the areas we're weak in, and that's the area he tends to attack us. Uh, so mm -hmm. does that sound scriptural to you? Yes, I don't have a problem. With, the devil knows the scriptures very well. And he doesn't have a name. The devil is a the word. Is, is Satan or the devil is an adjective. It's a description of, our, of an adversary. And he, and he knows when one of his spirits, like anger, is in us. They talk to each other. So they know the weaknesses very plainly because they communicate. So yeah, they, they know everything about us. But they also know that through Yeshua, we have authority. 
We don't have to obey them. And once we train those evil spirits that are attacking us, when our no's mean no, we say, no, evil spirit, I'm not doing that. They'll keep tempting us. But after a while, when they know that you know means no, they'll stop. And you don't get tempted nearly as much. But temptations never stop. I liken the evil spirit to, to a, a dog in that when you've well-trained a dog, that your no means no to them. Or a small child. If you if you if the small child learns that you know doesn't mean no, they're going to be pecking at you, pecking at you till they get what they want. It's the same type of thing. If we are if our nose mean no, we have a lot less challenges with Satan's demons. Now, prayer is so so important in Scripture, and we got to know who we're praying to and what we're praying, and yes. we need to pray for one another. And absolutely, the foundations of this ministry is what you're talking about: the the spiritual warfare, uh, the prayer to overcome that, and and the health is the physical uh, evidence of what's going on in our lives to a degree. And you yes, have biblical foundations to freedom, which uh, talks about how it says it right here: destroying Satan's lies with Yahweh's truths, and its biblical foundations to freedom of how to identify these. Uh, demons that are attacking us or, or that we're making the wrong choice and following and how to overcome that. Tell us a little about this book and then I want to hear about your latest book. All right. Biblical Foundations is a book that I put together over 20 years ago now. And it talks about discernment and accusing spirits, how Satan talks to us and attacks us. What do, and uh, uh, what is sin? Define sin. Since sin is any disobedience to the scriptures. And talks about anger, resentment, bitterness, fears, worries, anxieties, um, unbelief, which are sins. And it talks about uh, forgiveness, which is the antibiotic to sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's, it's the, our main book. It's the book that prescribes our way we do our counseling ministry, way we uh, teach uh, the scriptures. And... We've sold now like 130 or 40,000 copies over the last 20 years. Um, it's our primary book. It's one of our primary sources of income. It's, um, it's a manual for personal sanctification. It shows you what sin is, tells you how to deal with sin. So it's an applied course in personal sanctification is the way I'd like to describe it. So if you want to be a vessel of honor, you want to be become his bride, those, they'll, both, they'll eat, those terms are synonymous and they mean that, that we've got to stop sinning. We've got to cleanse ourselves. We've got to get rid of all the spots and wrinkles, which are sins and uh, learn what God's way is and do it. The key word is do it. So we, this is a process where we actually teach people to do, how to forgive, and actually physically do it. So we, we, the only reason it works is because we physically do it. If we just talk about it, you're wasting your time. The, the whole process, the book is written in such a great way, and it's, it's changed my life. Uh, he always led me to your ministry, and, and it's just changed my life. And it's a, it's a book that's fallen apart on my desk because I read it so often, and I use it so often, and I recommend everyone get it. I'm going to put the link to Art's website below. And also he has uh, some uh, online meetings they have uh, on a weekly basis and they have other meetings, but you can get this book and other books. Now he has other books. He was talking uh, about one before about identifying different diseases and the different spirits of uh, the cause of those diseases, uh, which is an excellent book as well. And then his latest book, uh, which I'm really excited uh, for yeah, in his own in his own image. That's the one that talks about the particular the diseases, diseases. And, how the immune and, system and, and and hormonal systems work, and how anger and resentment and bitterness affect those uh, from a medical standpoint. Yeah. The new book that you're talking about is the Bride. This is all about that process of becoming a vessel of honor, and how that works in Scripture, and how he, how Yeshua, Jehovah, has continually renewed his covenant. Every time we make a mistake and break it, don't do our part, he's provided a return. Tremendous grace, all the way back with Adam and Eve. 
it's it's a little small booklet. It's not very thick, but uh, it's it's a lot of the truth we've been talking about today comes out of this. So uh, here's one that we've just finished. Pastor Pat on my staff here has written this book on Galatians. Now the Galatians is the book that the church always uses to to explain how Paul uh, did not follow the Torah, how Paul created a new covenant and, and a new religion right along with their Jesus. Well, Acts 24 says that Paul plainly says he followed the Torah. And this explains Galatians from the Hebrew language, the Hebrew culture concept. Paul did not start a brand new religion. He lived and taught the Torah. This goes through that in great detail. Uh, here's another one. I don't know if you've seen it or not. We've put all this together in a children's book. All of Biblical Foundations now is in a children's curriculum. Uh, 34 lessons for, for any purpose, Sunday school, wherever you want to use it. But it teaches all the principles out of Biblical Foundations about forgiveness and about fear, how to make choices. So this children's curriculum, as it says on there, uh, which do you choose? Everything we've talked about today has been choices. This is the kids' version of that. It's powerful. It was written by Janice Coulter. There's her picture on the back of the book. And she's a professional teacher. My wife was part of this. And two other professional teachers put this together. It's powerful. It's one of the uh, most comprehensive curriculums I've ever seen. Uh, we buy curriculums for our, our Sunday school programs, which are Sabbath programs. We don't meet on Sunday. We meet on Sabbath. So uh, teaching our children how to make healthy choices so they don't make some of the horrible choices that the rest of us have made. So it's all about teaching the next generation. Absolutely. I, 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 I just love your ministry and everything you're about. And uh, anyone can see me in my morning prayers, uh, <clears throat> looking at this book and my teachings, uh, reading right straight out of it often. And it's just wonderful. And I just thank you, uh, <clears throat> Pastor Art, for just uh, everything you're doing. And I, I just pray you keep up uh, the great work. And I just thank you for your ministry and uh, everybody. The link is uh, to his uh, website and it's akwellspring.com akwellspring.com you could find all these books on there and some other teachings and information and uh, and his contact phone number as well is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience today before we uh, finish well paul first thank you for having me on your program i thoroughly love to share like this and the thing i would probably the most important thing i can say to anybody it's become his bride. You're not automatically the bride because you say a few magic words. Becoming the bride is about your behavior. And it's behavior that counts, not words. So learn what your behavior is. Align your behavior with what God says is his way. And you will have that blessed, happy life. Doesn't mean everything goes perfect, but you'll have a joyful life of peace and shalom. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Put your comments and questions below. Have a great day and Yahweh be with you all and shalom, shalom. Shalom. I found the answer. I